It's good to see you all today. Like I said, I just I love my church family. It's so good to be back. Alex and I went hunting too last week, hunting for holes in the ground. We found a really big one in New Mexico called Carlsbad Caverns. It wasn't too hard to find because there were a lot of signs. Carlsbad Caverns. And there's nothing in, nothing in New Mexico other than that. Not much anyway. Not where we were. Hey, I want to begin with reading today's passage just right off for you. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you want to turn there, that would be fantastic. We're going to continue our study series of promises, prescriptions, and paths of Romans and Corinthians. And so if you could find yourself in 1 Corinthians, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. One of our elders or deacons will get a Bible for you. And if you need one at home, take it with you. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, <laughs> you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer who is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? And then he asks a question, he's serious. He's just, don't you judge those who are inside? But God judges outsiders. Put away the evil person from among yourselves. Now just remember we're in the, a, a, a chapter in which there is sin going on in this church at Corinth. Um, there's a man who has been living with and having an affair with his stepmother. Paul is calling them out on it. And the thing was, as we talked about a few weeks ago, is they were, they were actually celebrating the sin within their church. And he's calling them on that, saying, don't you guys judge those who are inside? Um, I'm going to do something different today, guys. And uh, in the way I preach and what I am preaching. So first I want to begin by showing you uh, a picture of a, a gentleman. So Ashley, are you back there? Nobody's back there. Lost my person. That's okay. If we can uh, click on the picture here. Uh, I want to show you this picture. This is Dan Peterson. Dan Peterson is Pastor Dan Peterson. He's Pastor Dan Peterson. He was the pastor at the Prairie Hill Evangelical Free Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, when Marnie and I took on our first paid position as a youth pastor couple when we were first married. And he was the pastor. Go to the next picture. I'll introduce you a little bit more here. So we've got uh, Dan and his wife Heidi there. And then in front of them, under Heidi over here is Carl. And then there's Amy and Mark. Carl was in our youth group. Carl is now like probably somewhere between 45 and 47 years old. Uh, ooh, I'm old. Anyway, uh, and Amy and Mark were too young for a youth group at the time, but we did connect with them. And yeah, they were sweet kids. I want to show you one more picture of Pastor Dan. One more picture. There's Pastor Dan Peterson as a new grandpa. Isn't that a sweet picture? And I know you don't know this guy, but yeah, what a sweet picture, Grandpa. This was February of 2012. In October of 2012, he went home to be with the Lord. He died of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, just a few months after this. Uh, it was unfortunate for how I found out. I actually went to one of our... Uh, North Central District meetings. I was, a, I was already pastoring here and uh, went to one of the meetings and I saw a guy in the restroom. He's like, I was, oh, he's like, I'm from Maple Grove. I said, oh, you're a pastor at Maple Grove. So you know Dan Peterson. Yeah, I said, how's Dan doing? Dan passed away. Really? I hadn't heard. Um, the message I'm going to preach to you today is a message that he gave. Now, there were a couple of messages that he gave that I remember well. 
this is one of them. The first one that I remember well, he started the message like this. Let's see. See if you can hear this. Try and get that right up there. Can you turn that up a little? Oh, wrong thing to turn up. Where is it? Anybody know that song? Money by Pink Floyd, that's right. He started this message out with Money by Pink Floyd. And Marnie, remember this? They were boom, boom, ba boom. And it was a message on where your treasure's at and dealing with money, of course, and all that. I'll tell you, that was 30 years ago. I remember it well. And I used it again just now so that it'll stick in your brain, okay? So that was one of them. The other message was the one that you're gonna hear today. Um, hmm. It was a message that he preached on 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. And at the time, I was finishing up college. I was a new youth pastor. And guys, you know, at that time, I remember struggling through, especially coming out of high school, going into college, and trying to convince my friends things in their life that they needed to change. And one of those just, you know, it's kind of a benign thing overall, but man, I was really working on my friends in high school to get them to stop listening to their secular music. Some of the bands they were listening to, I was like, trying to talk them out of it. I even did a speech for class on the evils of rock music, and I did such a good job, I ended up going to state with that one, and I'm telling all of the judges and everybody that they need to quit listening to this rock music, which I know some of you are laughing at because you know I've got Pink Floyd on my, right there but I'm trying to convince them that they need to change and they need to change their actions. And what I'm, what I'm doing at this time is I am trying to get non-Christians to live as though they have the Holy Spirit. And then Pastor Dan preached this message and it stuck with me. And so I wanna share it with you today. I wanna to give credit for the message to Dan. Um, you know, some of it's my own, but a lot of this is his, his notes. It gives me joy to share this with you because one of the other beauty, uh, beautiful things of this is that when a faithful man takes the word of God faithfully and preaches it, that message lives on way longer than we do. And it just brings me joy to know that there's a message that he preached 30 years ago that I get to share some of that with you now. And I'm hoping that even some of you kids uh, younger ones are going to walk away thinking about it. So that brings me joy. So we begin. Brought an apple. Thank goodness. Almost lost my apples because Marnie didn't know I needed an apple today. And she gave my apples away yesterday, but that's okay. She didn't know. But she had an apple, so she saved me too. An apple. This message is about apples. Good apples and bad apples. The word apple isn't used in this passage, but it's gonna come into play. Uh, wanna begin by asking you a question. If you could nominate one verse out of the scriptures that are the mo that's the most abused verse used, what would it be? Now, you don't need to say it out loud. You can just think about that. I'm going to give you a suggestion. You might think of something like, uh, God helps those who help themselves. Oh, but then wait a minute, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> Cleanliness is next to godliness, not, not in the Bible either. Uh, Dan said, I have a friend who just graduated with a PhD, and my friend came up with what he thinks is the most abused scripture verse out there, and he's got a PhD, so who am I to argue, right? And so here was the verse, it was from Matthew chapter seven. That verse in Matthew seven says this, do not judge so that you won't be judged. Boy, there's a powder keg for you. Not my words. I don't talk like that usually. That, those are Pastor Dan's ver words. Boy, there's a powder keg for you. In other words, it could be explosive. Don't judge lest ye be judged. Talk about a verse that has been misused and abused. It would probably be that one. 
In fact, we just heard Paul talking about the fact in 1 Corinthians 5 there that we ought to judge in certain circumstances. But how do we, how do we navigate all this? Because, uh, you know, the world kind of has this hands off, uh-uh-uh, don't judge me. Don't judge me, lest ye be judged. But how do we navigate this uh, when it seems like in Scripture in places it tells us we ought to judge, in other places it says pretty clearly it's not your business to judge. Well, this sermon came out of a series called Sermons You Always Want to Hear. And what Pastor Dan Peterson had done is he asked the congregation to send him messages. This was before email, I think. It was pretty close. 1994 is about when email was hitting maybe. You know, I mean, it's pretty early on at least. Uh, he had people send him messages asking questions that they wanted answered, and then he did a series on that. And here was the question. So go to the next slide there. Question was, what is the difference really between godly discernment on the one hand, something that we generally think of as very positive, and on the other hand, a judgmental spirit, which is often seen as much more negative and maybe something much more caustic. And it's a difference that maybe our culture doesn't fully understand, maybe we don't fully understand it either. And so, in general, our culture has a hands-off policy when it comes to something like that. Uh, all the way from, hey, walk a mile in my shoes, right? Where you're kind of saying, unless you know my heart, unless you know my thoughts, unless you know what it's like to be me, you have no right to judge me. You have no right to call into question what I've done. You have no right to call into question what I'm thinking. Uh, it's a culture that says, hey, judge not. Well, at the time that uh, this message uh, was given, the religious editor of World Magazine had done an interview with President Clinton. And this is what she said in that interview. She said, you know, it's not my, about Clinton, you know, it's not my job to judge whether he's a phony or not. Because nobody can judge that. I don't see him in his quiet time. I don't watch him pray. I don't know. And we think to ourselves, well, there's some legitimacy to that, right? We don't know a person internally in their heart and all. But the question is, is that an absolute that we can't judge anything about anybody at any time? And the article went on, President Clinton was responding to questions on the issues of homosexuality and abortion. And Clinton said this, he said, it's not right to go around saying everybody's Christianity or religious faith or character should be evaluated totally in terms of these two issues, homosexuality and abortion. Uh, as if those things don't matter for your faith, right? Only God knows the truth of the person's heart and the full facts of a person's life, not only what they have done, but what they have not done. It's kind of another example of, don't judge me. Don't judge me on the things that, by the things that I stand for or what I stand for. They really don't matter. You don't know my, my heart inside. Do we have the right or even the ability to judge other people or to discern where other people are coming from? That's the critical issue. Is it right or wrong? So a couple of quick definitions, not to spend too much time on this, but on one hand, by the way, you can, oh, you did. Good job, Ashley. Or who's back there? Yeah, it is Ashley. Good job. She follows me even when I don't give her the cue. That, that's, that's awesome. Discernment on one hand, judgment on the other hand. If we take a look at those two, discernment is quite simply the ability to tell the difference between right and wrong. It's ability to take the apple and look to see if there's any really bad rotten spots on it or bruises. It's not deciding what is the destination of this apple. It's just looking to see if there's rotten spots. In my bag of apples, Marnie, I had a rotten apple. How was that one, <laughs> Ryan? Did you eat it? Not that one. Okay, he didn't eat that apple. He's, you looked at it, and you're like, oh, there's a bad spot, right? It's the ability, discernment takes the apple and looks at it and says, okay, that's a piece of good fruit, or 
that's got a bad spot on it, or that's a rotten apple. Uh, it's not necessarily making comments about the destination of the apple. It's just looking at the condition of the apple in its current state. In fact, discernment tends to be more self-oriented for ourselves. As we look at the life of another person, what we are kind of saying to ourselves is, do I want to imitate that person? Do I want my life to look like that person's life? That's the question of discernment. Given more of an external feel, is that person in line with what scriptures say, right? And I want to mold my life after Jesus Christ. And are there people in my life that I can look at that gave me a good example of what Jesus was like or is like? Uh, I'll tell you this, by the way. Pastor Dan Peterson, there were a lot of things about him that are worth emulating. His integrity, his joy, his compassion, his peace. I was a young, dumb youth pastor. Man, he had a lot of grace for me and patience, taught me well. Uh, and integrity. Um, he's a guy that I would say, yeah, I kind of want my life to look like him. I want to kind of be a pastor like he was. You know, I've had two Pastor Dans, Pastor Dan Peterson, Pastor Dan Swanson. Pastor Dan Swanson was up in Cocado. He was my pastor there. Also a guy worth emulating. So if you're a Pastor Dan, so far, I'm, I'm two out of two. So that's, that's, they're good guys. Judgment, on the other hand. Judging somebody else takes discernment an extra step. One critical step further, maybe I have discerned something. This apple has a bruise on it. Or this apple looks pretty good all the way around. I've discerned something. Uh, a judgment makes a pronouncement upon the apple. Oh, this apple's bruised. Throw it away. I condemn it. It's not worth keeping. That's judgment. It's to pronounce condemnation upon it. Um, so the question first, is it possible to be discerning without really judging, without carrying it that one extra step. Uh, it's also a side note, it's unfortunately possible, just be aware of this, we can judge without sometimes being terribly discerning. Sometimes we forget to look at what God says about it and we just jump to a, dis, uh, to a judgment. Uh, we rush into that. But biblically, there's a distinction between discerning and judging uh, and I think what we just said there about the two holds up pretty well. For instance, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, up on the screen, says, And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you can approve the things that are superior and can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. You see, that's an internal aspect why am I discerning? So that I can become more like Christ. I can know right, I can know wrong, and I might not follow the wrong person. It's an obvious thing that it, it's gotta be done. We are to be discerning people. So don't take anything at face value. You know, even the scriptures say that we're to discern the spirits. If we believe the Holy Spirit is telling us something, we're to discern and test and make sure. Is this the Holy Spirit or not? And the same with people. And we don't like thinking about that way necessarily. Like, we test everybody to discern. I don't just grab an apple without looking at it at all and start to bite out of it, do I? I take a look at it and check. By the way, if there's a big old bruise on the apple, doesn't mean the whole apple's bad, does it? Sometimes I just cut out the bruise. 
get rid of the bruise, get rid of the bad part. But test. Be a person of discernment. In fact, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, uses part of that uh, discernment as being how one is defined as being mature. Look at this. Solid food is for the mature. And then it defines that. It says, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil, to make that differentiation. So discernment is good. And it's something we're always to be doing. It's always good. Discernment is always right. There's no place in the Bible that says you shouldn't use discernment in this or that area. We're always to be discerning. Judgment is a lot trickier. <laughs> when it comes to taking that critical step beyond discernment, judging can be a lot more difficult because the Bible seems to say at certain times it's okay to judge. You ought to judge. And other times it says it's absolutely forbidden. So the best way that we can really sort through the Bible data on this is to really look at what Pastor Dan called insiders and outsiders. And by the way, as we're talking about this, we're talking about a discernment and a judgment within spiritual things of the life. Uh, we should always be judging when it comes to things like murder <laughs> or robbery. Those, I mean, we can judge those inside or outside the church if you are a uh, a Christian judge, you still need to make those judgment calls on those situations. And the scripture gives us guidance for that. We're talking, about, we're talking about a person's heart, their spirit. We're talking about spiritual things of their life and really getting down to, hey, is this something that should be in the church or not in the church? And so we look at insiders and outsiders because there's a definite feel in Scripture for how we should approach people inside the Church of Christ, believers, those who confess that they are followers of Christ versus those who do not profess faith in Jesus. There's a difference, and I think we need to appreciate that. So again, hear this very clearly. We always discern. We're always to be testing we're always looking to see, is there rotten places on the apple? Testing the fruit. Dan made this statement, I will affirm it. Uh, he just said, I can't find any place in scripture. And he said, I'm open to instruction on this, if you can help me, but I can't find any place in the scripture where I am told here and now to judge those outside the church. Discern, yes. It's very necessary. Figure out where somebody's coming from? Absolutely. But judging, going to the point of condemning for those who are wrong, I'm not sure we're supposed to do that. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 gives us an explicit answer that we're not supposed to do that. So look at chapter, uh, at uh, 1 Corinthians 5 again at verse 9. Look at this again. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world, or the greedy, the swindlers, idolaters, otherwise you'd have to leave the world. It's all around you. You'd have to leave the world to get away from it. But he says, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, who is sexually immoral. Jump down to verse 13. God judges the outsider. But you, you're supposed to put away the evil person from among yourself. Whose job is it to judge the outsider? According to the word, what? God. It's God's job. It's not my job. Now, sometimes God asks us to partake in some aspect of that. But it is not my job to be the ultimate, especially anybody's eternal judge. It's hard for Christians to take hold of that. It is. We have strong feelings about what's right and what's wrong, don't we? And we should, because hopefully we've studied God's word and we, we've seen here's what's right, here's what's wrong, and what's good, what's bad, what's evil. And it's hard for us not to put on those judicial robes with outsiders and stand over them and go, God's going to get you for that. Maybe you've run into it where 
you had put on those judge robes and somebody from the outside said, who are you to judge me? And you know what? In a lot of those instances, they're right. I want to say this, I'm going to, what I'm going to say right now is Pastor Dan, <laughs> verbatim. He said, what a relief when you begin to understand. When I understand, I don't need to tell everybody out in the world how to live. I need to stand for what's right and for what's in God's word. And if they ask, oh boy, I'll tell them. But I'll tell you this, I'm not gonna go out. It's not my intention to go out and condemn people. I have no business doing that. That's God's business. Now, what about somebody, however, who is inside the church? Is that different? What about somebody who claims to be a Christian? Somebody who professes faith in Christ? It's an entirely different ball, ball game. We need to be discerning, yes, of all people, but within the church, there are times where we are called to judge at an appropriate time, in an appropriate way, with love, with the intention to restore, with tears in our eyes. Not indiscriminately, but with a proper sense. And when I say that, I mean a few things. One, we don't so much judge the person as we're judging that action. We condemn an action that maybe was done by somebody in the church and we love them. Maybe it's a teaching, whatever the case might be. Number two, we don't judge with a sense of giddiness like, I, mean, I can't judge those guys out there, but in here, woohoo, <laughs> I'm going to let them have it. Right? No. We don't do it with a sense of self righteousness. We correct with humility. We don't do it with a sense of holding up my own preferences. We're not talking about preferences. Hey, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way, so therefore I am going to condemn the way you have done this. No, we search the Word of God together, and we see what God says about the issues at hand, and we discern according to the Bible. And if it gets to the point in the church, like what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where clearly this man is doing something saying he's a believer in the church and he is clearly going against God's word, Paul says, guys, don't you judge those in the church? And what's he mean by that? When we look at that whole thing, he is saying, remember from a couple weeks ago, he's saying, you gotta, get, you gotta pull them out of the church if they are not repentant. If you have gone to them, if you have used Matthew 18 and you've gone to them and talked with them and they haven't repented, if you've brought an elder with you and gone and talked with them and they still have not repented, and if you said, hey, you need to change or you cannot be a part of this body and they have not repented, you need to set them outside of the church and hopefully, prayerfully, the Holy Spirit's going to let them get to the place where they'll come back to be restored. We do it in love, tears in our eyes, and we say, what you've done is wrong. What you've done is a violation against God's word. And brother or sister in Christ, we want to see you restored. We love you. We're concerned. By the way, this is one of the reasons why today I'm being very careful. You're going to hear me say over and over again, this is what Pastor Dan said. Or what. You know why? Because plagiarism is wrong. If I take credit for the things that he said, then, then what you need to do is discern that I'm doing something wrong and it is the right thing for you to say, hey, Pastor Steve, I'm kind of concerned. You're taking credit for something that you didn't do. That's wrong. And your goal is to restore me, to help me to repent. All right, now what about somebody who calls themselves a believer but isn't really a believer? Well, we saw that in the passage, right? 
don't associate with anyone who claims to be a believer and is doing these things. I think it's important for us to understand one of the first things we need to discern is, is this person a true believer or not? Now again, I am nobody's eternal judge. However, scripture does guide us in one, do they proclaim a faith in Christ? Are they saying, I am a believer? And if they are, can I look at their life and see fruit? Right? You've heard this before, and I don't want it to be cheesy, but guys, we're supposed to be fruit inspectors. That doesn't mean that I'm an inter- eternal judge. It means I'm looking to see, is there good fruit in their life? Because if they're living in the same sinful ways that they always have been, I might ask myself, you know, I'm not exactly sure whether or not they're truly a believer. And if they don't pass Pest. If they do not pass the test, it's not my job to condemn them, it's to bring them to Christ. There's a big difference. Do you remember in Acts chapter 16 when Lydia came to Christ? The apostle Paul is there. He leads Lydia to Christ in Macedonia. Lydia's trying to get him and this group to come stay at her house. And she says this, she says, if you consider me a believer, some translators say, if you consider me faithful, then come stay at my house. And what she's saying, she's opening herself up, to say, discern who I am and move forward based off of those judgments that you have made, that discerning. So we can look for the profession of faith. We test the fruit. And if they fail, then we try to lead them to Christ. I want to bring them to Christ because Christ can change them. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. And I am still working on learning that because this is a struggle yet, right? There's t- I want to sometimes be the Holy Spirit. Now, we are to be the hands and feet of Christ, right? But I am not the Holy Spirit. I cannot sanctify anyone. So we come to this point and we think, well, we can kind of handle that, okay? People outside the church, I don't judge. People inside, well, we judge, but it's with right intentions and it's according to God's word. It's with tears. It's, it's with a goal to restore them. But there are still some things that sometimes the church misses. One of those, integrity. See, when we judge others, we need to do so with integrity and humility. I cannot go to anybody and say, hey, here and here and here is how you're sinning, if in fact I am also doing here and here and here, right? That is what Jesus was saying in Matthew 7. He said, take the log out of your own eye first, And then that will help you take the sliver out of your brother's eye. So in that instance, when we come to that conclusion, realization, what we need to do is go to our brother and say, hey, you know what? I think I've been wrong in this and I I think you're doing the same thing. We've been sinning and we need to repent. Would you repent with me? Um, Integrity. The other one is mercy. Mercy to judge with mercy. Sometimes people just get, there. I don't know what it is, but some people just get a kick out of being judgmental. And we need to pull back and say, no, 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 no. That's not who we, who we are in the church. We need to be merciful. In the church, who other people have experienced the kind of mercy that we've experienced? Guys, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. Yeah, a couple weeks ago I got ordained, but you know what? I didn't, I didn't earn that in it without Christ. It's what Christ has been doing in me all these years. Mercy. Certainly in the body of Christ, we know the greatest mercy of all, and we can be merciful. Now that doesn't excuse the situation. You don't look at what Paul says here and see Paul saying, well, we know that he's doing this. He's sleeping with his stepmother, blah, blah, blah. I know he's not repentant, but you know, he's really had a tough life. Just kind of let it go. He's not saying that. He's saying we got to deal with this. It needs to be addressed, but we can also be full of mercy. Truth in love. So just a few points of application, guys. 
We're going to learn the Word of God. We're going to become more like Christ, and we'll let God be God. That's where we're going with this. First one, learn the Word of God. This is, this is how we discern what's right and wrong. It's not my opinion. We go to the Scripture together, and we see what is right, what is wrong. Think of Hebrews 4.12. Go to Hebrews 4.12. Next slide there. Maybe. We got that. Is it working? Okay. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Notice it doesn't say Steve does that or the elders do that. It's the word of God that discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So we learn the word. Let the word do the discerning for us. Number two, become more like Christ. And I hope that just goes without saying that your life endeavor is to become more like Jesus. And guys, as you become more like Jesus, you will more perfectly be equipped to discern when it is necessary to judge. But Jesus does things remarkably different than we do, doesn't he? Uh, you think about some of the instances, I'm not going to go into all the details of them, but you think about Jesus at the well with the woman who has been married five times and now she's living with a, a man who is not her husband. Uh, how many of us have a tendency to just want to go and say, lady, you got to straighten out. And that wasn't Jesus' method there, was it? You go, Or the rich young ruler, you know? We might want to go, okay, well, hey, buddy, maybe you want to first give 10% to the church of that. And it's not the way Jesus approaches it, is it? He does things remarkably different. He's so full of mercy and compassion and yet truth. Number three, let God be God. He is the perfect judge. Here's how Pastor Dan closed out this message back in 1994. He said, I think of the homosexual population and what they think of the church. Now some of that, the way they think of the church, some of that is simply because we stand for what God says. And I believe that what God says is true. And everything we say, as long as we're saying homosexuality is wrong, it's going to be taken badly. But sometimes it's because they've seen a lot of anger in Christians and hate. And he says, I know some of these issues get our blood boiling and we can see and we can say that, well, it's so clear what God wants in regard to this issue or that issue, but who are we to judge those outside the church? Discern, yes, never stop discerning. Discern, absolutely. We cannot be fooled into thinking what God says is wrong is now somehow right. Discern, yes, but who are we to be their judge? God is the judge. We'll all stand before the throne of Christ. That's a promise. God will take care of every wrong. He will have the final say. That's a warning as we consider how we live. That's a release for us in regard to feeling as though we need to take his place. Release to God what is God's. We need to be able to say, you know, I disagree with you. We need to be able to say the Bible disagrees with you, but let God be the judge. Discern, yes. Condemn, it's not your job. In the church, we have a duty to each other for the sake of building up one another in the faith, but let God be God. Our job is to proclaim the truth, to proclaim the gospel, to lead people to Christ, and let God change them. Way too often, I've wanted to be the one to change somebody's actions. Marnie and I were family teachers at a, uh, some of you know where it was, but I'm, I, I won't say exactly where it was, but at a group home for boys and girls. And shortly into the situation, we found out that we were primarily behavior modification facilitators. We were taught in our training time 
that if you can change the outside actions, the heart is going to follow. And I thought, I don't believe that. You change the heart and the actions will follow. I believe that's scriptural. And so we bring their heart to Christ. Worship team, come back up. Um, thank you, Pastor Dan Peterson, for giving a message that I've carried for 30 years. <laughs> it's been an emotional couple of weeks for me, by the way, as I have been working through this. Because when you start going through, you start to remember how much you miss somebody. Father God, I pray that you would be glorified in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to know how to love our neighbor well. And even when we disagree, Lord, help us to be discerning. Help us to bring the light and the truth of Christ in a beautiful way. But Lord, help us to set aside any attitude of condemnation that we might be carrying with us. Lord, help us to point to right and wrong, but to do so in a way of love and understanding. And God, within the church as well, I thank you, Father, for the accountability you give us within the church. And Lord, for my brothers here that, and my sisters here, that um, if I mess up, I know they're gonna approach me, but they're gonna do it with with a heart to restore me. And I thank you for that. Because God, I know <laughs> that each and every one of us here have at one time or another failed. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And we confess our need for you in our brokenness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together.
Tell the world of the treasure you found. Lord God, we thank you that you are the treasure that we found, Lord. That we can step out into this world knowing that you will walk beside us, that your Holy Spirit resides in us, and that we can um, just fall on our face before you at any time. We can come to that altar, Lord. Just thank you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.